And uh, now I'm very interested to hear about uh, about the uh, application of uh, Yalronens after shoulder arthroscopy, and I will ask uh, Professor Leonard Funk to come and uh, present uh, his paper. Uh, Professor uh, Funk is from Ridington. So, right. Thank, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for all staying to listen to this. It's a great honor to um, speak alongside three, three of my personal heroes. So, um, you know, I, I feel very humbled to follow on after, after these three people. Um, yeah, I, I work at Wrightington, which is made famous by John Charnley. Hopefully you will have heard of him. Um, and we, we now have a, a, a very nice upper limb unit. It's the biggest um, upper limb unit in the UK. We have 11, shoulder sur we have 11 upper limb surgeons um, all just doing upper limb surgery. So uh, we invite you. We have lots of regular courses. Um, I've recently been appointed as uh, Professor of Orthopaedics and Sports Medicine at Salford University in Manchester, and uh, I oversee a, a number of projects largely involved with sports orthopaedics and simulator training and, and imaging as well, um, and happy to talk about that. One, one of my, my interests has been um, in, in viscous ill in the hyaluronans, and really my, my interest came in is when patients came back to me and they said, well, you know, I have impingement, you had a spur of bone, and you took the spur of bone away, and it's three weeks and I've still got pain. Why is it still sore? You took the spur of bone away, and you explain all about the biology and the recovery of the muscles. But even though we've advanced with arthroscopic surgery, we can get patients back quicker, less pain, they can return to work quicker, there's still a demand for people to improve better. So I've always felt, you know, is there something else out there that we can use to try and improve the pain and return them even quicker? Um, and although arthroscopy is a big improvement, it's still not a 100% benign procedure. Uh, hopefully you'll all be aware of studies um, that have shown the uh, harmful effects of large amounts of saline irrigation of joints which we would use in arthroscopic surgery. Um, the chondrocytes are, are killed off, synoviocytes are, are killed off during that period. If you immobilize a joint, the collagen mass is reduced within the tendons and you get this additional atrophy of cartilage and reduced prostaglandin levels as well. Um, most of this is probably short term. The joint probably recovers, but we don't know how much of this is, is permanent and how long does it last. And there's a large number of studies um, that have looked at this. Hyaluronin is naturally found within joints as part of the protective mechanism. It maintains the homeostasis and the natural environment within the joints. It provides nutrition to the cartilage and to the synovium as well as lubricating the joints. Um, it's normal part within synovial fluid which is found within synovial joints as well as within bursal cavities which have synoviocytes which line the bursal lining and produce hyaluronin. So exogenous hyaluronin, this is hyaluronin that you add later, such as viscosil, um, has been shown to give chondrolysis protection against the destruction of the cartilage, increase endogenous hyaluronin production, so it stimulates the synoviocytes to produce their own uh, hyaluronin quicker, it reduces the kinins in the joint, um, and it coats the pain receptors. Now some of the early studies and some of the early reviews showed that there was no benefit of hyaluronins, but this was because they were using the early hyaluronins with we had very high or very low kilodalton levels, and now studies have shown that there's a certain, certain molecular weight that is the most efficient. 
and that's greater than 800 kilodaltons. Um, and these are the most effective hyaluronins. So the studies that are coming out now are all generally, hopefully, using the, the right hyaluronins. With regards, there's a huge amount of non-clinical studies, but the, the, what interests me was the clinical studies. They started off with the temporomandibular joint, then the knee, and now a little bit on the shoulder. Here's some of the studies. The Matisse study is, is out there and another very good study. But the one that interested me the most was the Villamore study in 2005. And what really interested me is they had over 100 patients. It was a multi-center, um, randomized controlled trial, um, you know, a very good big study. And they showed a significant benefit with regards to post-op pain relief and earlier return to sports and activities in the viscosil group compared to the control group. And that was the one that really interested me. There's another study in 2007 where they compared viscosil versus diamorphine. Um, now, diamorphine injection into the bursas was an unusual practice. I don't know if anybody does that in the, here. But that was unusual. But they compared viscosil to diamorphine. They only had 20 patients. They did show an earlier discharge with the viscosil group, less side effects. They had much more nausea in the diamorphine group, which is not surprising with diamorphine. Um, uh, but they found no difference in pain at 24 hours. But their numbers were extremely small. And they were comparing something, diamorphine, which is not standard practice. We did our own study, uh, again a randomized controlled trial, looking at viscosil and local anesthetic after subacromial bursal surgery. Again, randomized uh, trial, we were blinded, um, and uh, we had 54 patients, um, uh, all had the standard treatment, the same throughout. One group had viscosil, the other group just had bupivacaine. Um, into the bursa, and then they had a standard post-op regime. Uh, we looked at the short-term outcomes, so the visual analog scale over 48 hours, the time to discharge analgesics requirements, and then reviewed them at three months with constant scores and patient satisfaction. So we found a, a quicker time to discharge in the viscosil group than the non-viscosil group, um, there were more patients who had no pain at, um, at, at four hours postoperatively, more who had severe pain in the non viscosil group, and the non viscosil group needed more analgesics, additional analgesics, than the viscosil group did. With regards to the medium term uh, results, roughly no difference, but patient satisfaction uh, was slightly better. Um, although this wasn't statistically significant at three months. Um, what we found was that earlier discharge, less post-op pain, less analgesic requirements in the viscosil group, and they seemed to be a bit more satisfied with a slight trend to increase. Now, my practice is predominantly I do about 60% sports um, shoulder and elbow uh, surgery, and particularly with these patients, there's an even higher demand to do everything possible to get them back quicker. One of the things that I think is a real benefit with hyaluronins, and this is the studies that have been done on flexor tendons and, and abdominal studies, is showing is they use it there routinely to reduce adhesions. And one of the problems I've found with revision subacromial uh, surgery is the scarring in the bursa after cuff surgery or decompressions. So I like to add it to, uh, to those particular cases to hopefully, again, reduce adhesions the same as they do with flexor tendon and abdominal surgery. Difficulty with proving that is you'd need a very a huge number of cases to show that. Um, so with all shoulder and elbow arthroscopies, I routinely use it. Um, improved recovery times, less pain, less stiffness, and less bursal adhesions. Um, thank you very much.